<laughs> I want to just talk about um, the, the, the connections to England for a moment because um, 2004 was a big banner year. I mean, the rug company just, you know, went to town on this carpet. And also there was the launch of Bloomingdale's. But um, the English appreciation for your work, do you think, I mean, it felt to me as though it was all about the garden and all about the appreciation for flowers, for a kind of pleasure factor in, in the color. The color was brilliant, but not, it was still, you know, sophisticated and right. not, not uh, rest, un, you know, unrestrained. Um, is it a Brit thing, the, the, the appreciation of, of the floral motif that's made you so popular in England? You know, I, 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 I now think I understand what it is, but when it was happening, I, I, I really didn't. I was just swept up by, you know, a lovely embrace from a country that seemed to appreciate everything that I put forth, you know. Mm -hmm. Where it's not exactly the same in this country, I think there's a lot more of a conventional and traditional mindset when it comes to textile design. Mm -hmm. You know, I was coming out of left field, I didn't have an education in it. My thing is really, my, my work is very free and organic, it's not very schooled and academic by no means. And um, I think the British population are, I mean, I always noticed this when I was sitting in design studios in the industry in nine to five jobs, that the British people in my studio were always the most clever, coming up with the most zany, outlandish, you know, Vivian Westwoody type, mm -hmm. um, you know, free-spirited. Paul Smith. Right. People like that. Yeah. Exactly. Like, yeah, his really prints free. Are nuts. Right. Like witty, tongue in cheek, yeah. you know, yeah. and my stuff had that sort of na naivete, I think, you know, and also the freedom um, that do you think they, they were? Do you think they were primed by the Bloomsbury artists like mm -hmm. uh, Vanessa Bell and Duncan Grant and people like that? Because yeah. they were pretty freewheeling, but their color doesn't approach yours right. uh, in terms of brilliance and play, and um, it's a much more restrictive palette. I don't think it's just time that's done that. I think it's a Brit thing. Some people say that my work is like modern arts and crafts. That's how they termed it in several articles, you know. And I, I like that. I embrace that. I think it's interesting. I do like William Morris very much. I think, you know, obviously who wouldn't? But um, I'm more attracted to painters like Emil Nolde and mm -hmm. and um, De Muth and Matisse, of course. You know, mm -hmm. you can't not say Matisse. And Bonard and, and people who love extraordinary color. I love. I, I can't live without color. Color yeah. for me is a healing force in this planet. It's the only one I know that I can, you know, help spread healing with. And um, we, we also mentioned German expressionism when we talked right. prior prior to to this, and that seems like an unlikely place to, from which to draw inspiration, except for the use of the color. They're, they're fearless with color. Right. And that's something that I think you you. Totally. It's my favorite emulate. period. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, I love all the German expressionists and I love Kandinsky. I love abstract expressionism. You know, I mean, I, I do a lot of work that's not on the screen that's c completely pure abstract. C I call them color essays. And mm -hmm. there are a couple of them in the book at the end, um, which are sort of like color meditations. I like to get away from form sometimes because it gives me a break from, you know, creating gardens um, and just to have a relationship with color um, on its own without any form around it. I think yeah. that's really refreshing and, it, and, and a challenge of a different kind. Well, they're exceptionally beautiful abstractions. I, that's Thank my you. opinion. Um, they really are essays in color. And they, because of your musical background, I often get a sense of musicality in the, in the design and in the art. Um, that I, I was kind of subconsciously aware of, and then the more I found out about you, it made sense. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that goes all the way back to Oberlin and yeah. Tanglewood and your... Well, my family are all uh, professional classical musicians, yeah. and they're all painters and, and writers. And, and, but, um, you know, so I grew up in this very cultured sort of environment, very inspired environment. And I'm sort of the black sheep, because I kind of, after having pursued a promising career in music, which it really was up until 1990, um, you know, I, I couldn't, I couldn't de deny or ignore what was happening. There was a big change going on inside me. I'd just come back from living in Europe, and I didn't feel like, you know, uh, taking auditions with my flute around the country for an orchestral position in a symphony, which is what I was trained to do and prepared to do. Um, something really, you know, 
st struck me. In, in fact, uh, I have I wrote this in my book, but during the years in my 20s where I was, before I entered into the fashion industry, I had a number of administrative jobs in New York, which I hated, and there was this Frank Stella sculpture that stood above <laughs> the elevator in the lobby of this building that I was temping at, and I remember tears just coming down my eyes every time I walked through that door because some part of me that, well, the person who went home every night to paint at her kitchen table quietly and, you know, without any hope on the horizon, would look at that and say, you know, how, how the hell does somebody get that? You know, how does somebody, yes. you know, become like that and, you know, have that presence in the art world and be able to contribute that? <laughs> and. Um, and so a few more years in the in the corporate <laughs> world was enough. And, and um, every time I pass that building <laughs> on Lexington, I still cry. I still look at it and, then, <laughs> and I think, you know, well, uh, thank I'm, God. You know. I'm, I'm glad that Frank Stella, <laughs> one of his enormous corporate wall pieces, could speak to you because they are, you know, they're they're pretty tough, large pieces. Yeah. But when you're in the corporate world, any f kind of color infusion will, you know, it, it, it made me feel yeah. alive. And yeah. the rest of the day, I didn't feel alive. The rest of the day, I was sitting in a gray office, you know, with no air, trying to make friends with people who did, didn't want to talk. And, you know, <laughs> you know, I was like the company chatterbox. She's, and, you know. she's from another planet. I was. You know, we, we love her, but we don't know where she's from. <laughs> it's true. I, don't it, I want to talk business a little bit. Okay. Um, because you, you're atypical in a lot of different ways, you know, not just because of the serious music background, but also because of the self-taught quality that you've brought to all of your art. But um, the licensing arrangements that you have now and the sheer number and variety of them, um, you've, you've seemed very laid back to me, but obviously you're a dynamo. <laughs> um, how do you structure that or keep track of all of the, uh, the the licensing, the offers that come in that you either accept or don't accept. Um, talk about that for us a, a little bit. Please. Well, my husband Felipe, whom I seriously indebted to for many things, right there, um, he was the one who said, you know, enough Willie Lomaning your butt around the fashion industry selling your one of a kind designs to Diane von Furschenberg and, 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 you know, anthropology and letting them make millions of dollars on your designs, you know, as a ghost designer. We got to we got to, you know, switch this up and change the recipe here. So he introduced me to licensing, which I had no knowledge of. And we ended up at the licensing show at the Javits uh, Center, which, you know, it's a booth where you set yourself up and you can display all your things and then manufacturers come around. And, you know, like Lennox China or, you know, stationery companies or rug companies and, and people, you know, come into your booth to see whether they want to represent you or not and sign you. So we had that first show, we had like 14 companies who came, including a gallery in the Hamptons, which was a nice throw-in um, for the fine art. And, you know, so we started, but this is a very slow process, and I have to emphasize that any relationship, I mean, you know, developing the product and getting to know who you're working with and choosing, and, and you know, I, there, in the first couple of licensing deals we had were very difficult because I didn't know the ropes, and we learned the hard way. You know, you get burned, and it's the best way to learn, unfortunately. But um, you know, because of those relationships, now we can navigate with more success towards the companies we know have integrity and who are not going to screw us. You know, and that's basically, you know. Well, I'm. I'm Delighted to hear. <laughs> no, you, you absolutely did. I'm delighted to, to hear that you're in a position now where you can. You're not compelled to, to accept offers for product that you don't want to work on, yes, and that you nice. can go at your pace rather than feeling like you're um, somehow subject to a lot of market pressures. That that in terms of the workload that you're taking on, because it's one thing that's typical of. of a lot of work, Kim's work that I've seen is that it's ex intensely personal. Um, whether it's choosing names for the mm -hmm. products, I mean, there, it's it's really thought out and it's personal and it's not some um, generic product in any way. It's all very chosen, and I would really well, hate to have that lost because I think that's unique it in the way that you work. Thank you. I, I don't plan to let it go. You Good. know, it's something. I love to name my my pieces because I feel very personally connected to all of them, you know, and and um, 
and I, I pretty much personify everything that's in our living room and I feel a, a connection to old pieces of furniture that have age and beauty and elegance about them and I you know it's just the way I see the world kind of that way so the, the book has one uh, memorable rescue that Kim made of a very <laughs> exhausted looking, I, in her description anyway, very exhausted Victorian settee that's been transformed into uh, something of great beauty, just the use of your fabric. Yeah, this was, this was a Victorian <laughs> loveseat at the flea market on a freezing cold January day where nobody, no, like three vendors were there and my husband and I, I dragged him down and I said, Oh my God! There's a Victorian love seat. I've always wanted a Victorian love seat, and the springs were popping out, and it was full of mold, and it had, you know, like probably millions of dust mites or whatever. But we had this really great upholsterer in the East Village. He's like the best kept secret, and um, I knew that, you know, with one of my fabrics and with his talent, we could put this woman back on the planet and, <laughs> you know, give her a, a makeover, you know? It's, it's, a, it's an extreme makeover, and it's a beautiful piece. Thank you. Yeah, well, the, the funny part about it was what, a glimpse of it was caught in the L Decoration uh, uh, interview, feature story that they did, and soon after that, the London Guardian called us and said, you know, we saw this love seat. <laughs> in that article, and we just want it on the cover of the magazine section on, in the Sunday, you know, Guardian. It's, and we pure, were, it's pure Dickens <laughs> from, from, from uh, you know, from absolute poverty to being on the cover. Um, I have a rescue need. I don't know what that means, but I have a rescue need. Well, my own Kim Parker story was because of my, I, I have an internship class usually in the spring, and uh, I had an intern at the rug company back in 2005, and this was very prominently displayed there, and um, they, uh, Annabelle, whom you know, um, praised it to me as one of their best sellers that year, right. and uh, I, just, I just assumed it was from a Brit, huh. it was you. Yeah. In my last life, I was maybe a Brit. <laughs> as as um, you and Philippe just seem to be total New York people, hmm. do you, I know, and you said you know, earlier that you get a lot of inspiration from just the life here, from living your lives and um, going around to flea markets and seeing the richness of, of what's around us every day. Do you feel the need to, to travel as well, to get inspiration, and it's, does that happen? You know, it's kind of interesting. I mean, I've been in New York for a while by default. I, I had to stay here for a while and um, and I, I started to have a feeling I, like a Buddhist existence in a sense. Like I, I wasn't traveling for a period and um, so everything in front of me became increasingly more beautiful somehow. You know I had I, I found beauty. The beauty that I needed to connect with I found and whether it was on Riverside Drive in the spring with all the cherry blossom trees, you know, and I could just sit under them with my dog or, you know, or uh, just look, walking down streets and, and, and seeing the vignettes in people's window boxes and how they would, you know, make love to their little plot of land, mm -hmm. you know, and it just charmed me and it, it, that was part of the reason that I also wanted to do the book because I felt you know, I have a love affair with New York, but you know, the thing is, the thing about the city is, it's very bittersweet. I think, you know, if you make it here and you and you, it's it, you've got to have a hard stomach. You really do, and it. But it's worth it. It's a wonderful feeling to, you know, to get there. But. Um,